how to use sampling science for looking at materials and wastes. The science understanding we're looking at um, cells require materials and removal of wastes, compare sources of materials for autotrophs and heterotrophs, and explain the need to remove wastes. So cells need material to do their job. They need uh, particular materials to be healthy, and if they don't get those materials inside them, then they can be quite unhealthy. Depending on the type of cell, it might need to take in an energy source like glucose into the cell. Um, it might be able to produce its own glucose, but then it needs to break that glucose down, and it also needs to get rid of waste materials too. Um, if you can't get materials into the cell, then you might not be able to reproduce because you need to make new cells, you need to have new materials. So you might need some proteins, you might need some lipids and so on. So cells need to get materials into them, but they also need to remove wastes. So we're going to look at the difference between autotrophs and heterotrophs in terms of how they get their energy um, and how they get their materials. So we're going to start by looking at photoautotrophs and chemoautotrophs. Now, autotrophs, they get energy from um, an outside source, an energy source, and they use that to make big molecules that they can then break down for their own energy. So they use small inorganic components, so small um, inorganic compounds, and they build them together using an energy source to make larger organic compounds. So photoautotrophs use light energy, and we've talked mainly about photoautotrophs. They use light to join carbon dioxide and water together to make glucose. So carbon dioxide and water are both small inorganic compounds. You react them together using the lights to uh, run the reactions that make the glucose, and you get glucose, which is an organic compound, so it's a large organic compound. You also get oxygen as a waste product, and we'll talk about the waste product later on. Um, Chemoautotrophs are different. They don't use light energy. They just use energy from fairly reactive chemicals to drive that process. So they can absorb these highly reactive chemicals um, from the environment and use the energy from the reactions of those chemicals to uh, join carbon dioxide together to make their glucoses. So they could use carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide, for example. Um, the hydrogen sulfide is providing the energy to produce the glucose from the carbon dioxide. Both carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide are small inorganic com uh, compounds. Glucose, again, is a large molecule. So let's talk about photoautotrophs first. We'll just use plants again as our example. So they need to get carbon dioxide and water into the cells so that the um, photosynthesis reaction can occur. And how do they do that? Well, they use their roots to suck water up from the ground, and there's holes in the leaves of the plants that can um, suck gases in. And one of the gases that they suck in is carbon dioxide. So it just sucks in um, air and they remove the carbon dioxide from the air and use that to do the photosynthesis. Those substances have to pass through cell membranes to get inside cells and then um, to the chloroplast for photosynthesis to occur. When the photosynthesis occurs, glucose gets produced and that glucose can then be transported around the whole plant. So the glucose leaves the um, cells where they're being produced. Some of the glucose will stay, but some of it will leave. It's transported through vessels in um, plants to the other cells in the plant, so then the other cells in the plant can absorb the glucose and use that for their energy. Chemoautotrophs are different. Um, so they use carbon dioxide and a chemical like hydrogen sulfide to make their large um, organic compounds. They use chemical energy from things like hydrogen sulfide, like we set up here, but they can also use elemental sulfur, hydrogen, and ammonia. They're all fairly reactive um, substances, so they use the chemical reactions to derive enough energy to join carbon dioxide together in particular ways. Um, to make glucose. They also need some hydrogens in there as well. They're usually single-celled bacteria and they live in very inhospitable places. So here we have um, a hot natural hot water pool and you can see the minerals in the water there. The bacteria, they live in these hot water pools at really high temperatures, you know, 70, 80, 90 degrees Celsius. Here's a picture of some bacteria that use arsenic um, to run their chemical reactions, which is very interesting because arsenic is very, very toxic to us, for example. It's a poison. Um, here's a hydrothermal vent. So hydrothermal vents, these are vents, the volcanic vents underneath the ocean. You get um, water coming out that's rich in minerals, and those minerals are used by bacteria to do this chemoautotrophic process. And again, this water can be several hundred degrees. Um, out the edges, it's a bit cooler, and that's where the bacteria can start to grab the uh, minerals and use that to do their chemoautotrophic processes. So now let's talk about hydrotrophs. So heterotrophs have to consume other organisms to get their energy. And they can be very simple, small, single-celled organisms, but we're going to treat, we're going to talk about animals. So here we have a food uh, chain. So we've got the photoautotroph, which is the grass down here, um, that is being eaten by the grasshopper. So the grasshopper gets its energy by eating the grass. 
Then we have the snake that gets its energy from eating the grasshopper, and we've got a hawk that gets its energy from eating the snake. So these three animals that have a digestive system that breaks down the um, grass, well, if we look at the grasshopper, it breaks down the grass, if we look at the snake, it breaks down the grasshopper, and so on. They break down those organisms into smaller molecules, which are still quite large, that have a lot of energy in them, and then they can transport those around their body using a digestive system um, matched with a circulatory system. So the grasshopper has a digestive system to break down the grass, it gets its energy out of the grass, and then when the grasshopper is eaten by the snake, the snake's digestive system can break down the grasshopper into those molecules. And those molecules get transported around in uh, sort of hemolymphidity in the um, grasshopper and blood in these two guys gets transported around the body so that every cell can get some of that energy, so those molecules that produce energy. Now those molecules that produce energy, they're really big. We break them down into smaller compounds like carbon dioxide and water, and when we do that we store the energy in a molecule called ATP, and we'll talk about that another time. So here's some examples of some of the molecules that we break down. So over here we have um, saccharides, which are sugars. So we've got glucose over here, we've got sucrose over here, which is um, a glucose and a fructose molecule stuck together, and then we have um, starch down here. So all of these molecules contain lots of sugar rings that we can break down to get energy out of and like I said we store the energy in ATP. Once you break down most of the sugar in your body you'll start to break down fat. Down here this is a triglyceride. Um, triglyceride is another word for a fat or an oil. Um, again there's lots and lots of uh, chemical bonds in here that we can break down and when we break those chemical bonds we release energy and again we can store that in ATP. The way that fats and oils are broken down is they're first converted into sugars and then those sugars are broken down for energy. So it works that way. You can turn a fat into a sugar, but sugar doesn't turn into fat, which is a very um, important idea. The last one that can be broken down is protein. So here we have proteins, which is made of a lot of amino acids joined together. And the amino acids have different shapes, and that means that they form a 3D structure of their own once they're all joined together. Now you can break down amino acids for energy, but normally it's not a very good idea. If you're doing that by, for example, running a marathon, and then your muscles start breaking down to produce energy so that you can complete the marathon, uh, that can be quite unhealthy. Um, the breakdown products of breaking down proteins can lead to kidney troubles, and that's not good. So breaking down those compounds produce wastes, and those wastes need to be removed from the organism, or otherwise um, the cells that make up the organism can get quite unhealthy. So we can get waste products produced from processes like photosynthesis, fermentation, and aerobic respiration. Those waste products can't be used by the cells, especially if they build up in large concentrations. So if that uh, concentration gets too high, then the um, cells might start dying, and therefore the whole organism might start dying if it's multicellular. Waste products get excreted out of the cell membrane in a variety of ways. So down here we have a bit of a picture showing a process called exocytosis. So exocytosis is where um, products, uh, waste products get packaged up into a little vesicle. That vesicle merges with the cell membrane and then it spits out the waste into the extracellular environment, so the bit around the cells. Um, if this was in you, um, the extracellular environments would include blood vessels that can transport the waste away. You're quite a large organism and you have an excretory system to help get rid of the waste products that are produced um, in your cells. So uh, your liver breaks down a lot of toxic compounds um, and then the breakdown products of the liver are often circulate around the body and go to the kidneys. The kidneys are responsible for removing waste products and storing them in the bladder and then weighing them out. But then you also get rid of waste products through your lungs and your skin. So when you're breathing, you're breathing out carbon dioxide and water, which are waste products of the aerobic respiration process. Um, when you sweat, you can get rid of water, but you can also get rid of urea, which is a breakdown product of proteins. So I've just mentioned some of the waste products um, that you should probably know about. So carbon dioxide is produced when you break down glucose, both aerobically and anaerobically, um, depending on how you anaerobically break it down. Too much carbon dioxide isn't good for a cell because carbon dioxide, um, when it's dissolved in water, produces a weak acid. So if you get too much carbon dioxide floating around, that can produce acidic conditions and acidic conditions can change the shapes of enzymes, which means the enzymes stop working. If your enzymes stop working, that means a lot of your chemical reactions will stop working, and life is essentially a whole heap of chemical reactions. Um, lactic acid is produced when anaerobic respiration occurs in um, animals, like you, humans. So that lactic acid that's being produced, um, again, we can create acidic conditions if we produce too much, and that can be harmful to cells. It can stop the cells from working. Um, ethanol is produced in anaerobic respiration. Ethanol is ridiculously toxic. It's used um, in hand sanitizer, for example, to kill bacteria. So a buildup of ethanol is quite bad. Um, so again, the ethanol needs to be broken down or removed um, from the cells that are producing it. Some other examples of waste products that need to be removed from cells. Um, urea I just talked about uh, before. So when you break down a protein, you get urea um, being produced. Um, urea contains a lot of nitrogen, so it gets rid of your waste nitrogen in the molecule called urea. 
too much urea floating around your body will damage your kidneys. Um, water too is produced in aerobic respiration and too much water is bad for your cells. Um, too much water surrounding cells can cause them to swell. It can change the concentrations of things like salt in your body and uh, if you don't have the right concentration then uh, things like nerves will stop working. Um, too much water will change your blood pressure and also too much water will cause damage to kidneys as well. So if you drink too much water you can die. It's quite interesting. Um, both of these are removed by the kidneys. So Water is removed through your lungs as well, but also by your kidneys. And, uh, but urea specifically is one of the main things that's removed. When you urinate, the urine uh, contains urea, which is that waste product. That's the way that we get rid of it mostly. We can sweat out a small amount of urea, but we get most of it, rid of most of it through the urine. So today on Flipping Science, we looked at the different materials that different organisms need, and also um, waste products and how they're removed. That's it for Flipping Science today. See ya.